I on? Before we get into God's word this morning, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we look to hear from you. Father, as a man, all I can do is give words. But it's your Holy Spirit that takes those words and ignites them with faith in our hearts. Ignites them for conviction. Lord, that we might be convicted of sin in our life, that we might be challenged to a more righteous life, that we might be encouraged in our walk. And so, Father, as we spend our time together this morning, we would ask that you would speak to our hearts as only you can do. Give us ears to hear what your spirit longs to say. And we pray for the other Bible-believing churches in the tri-state area. Father, that you would minister to your children wherever they may be gathered. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that your word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword that's able to cut very deep to the very depths of our heart and soul. And so, Father, we commit this time to your loving hands, and we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, <clears throat> I will be talking to you about being hardened by deceit. And there are, there are sins of omission and sins of commission. Sins that we do and sins that uh, we do without, because we're not doing something. Okay? And so not every sin, in a sense, is something that we're, we think of as sin. But if God tells us to uh, worship him and we only do it once in a blue moon or whatever the case would be, are we really worshiping him? as he deserves to be worshipped. And there are, so there are sins that we commit and sins that we commit by not doing something that we ought to do. And then within those sins that we commit, there are sins that are just thoughts, sinful thoughts, and there are sinful words that we speak and there are sinful things that we do. And oftentimes we find ways of covering sin in our life by applying some other word that makes it sound nicer, softer. We speak of uh, today somebody that, let's say, is committing adultery, and we see that, well, they're having an affair. Well, let's call it what it is. God says it's sin. If you're married, you're married and you need to be committed to that marriage. And we don't need to find all these pretty little words, if you will, to soften sin in our life. Oh, he made a mistake. I listen to this all the time when I turn on the news. Well, he's a good boy. He only shot five people. He just made a mistake. Well, as long as we have that mentality, things are going to go from worse to worse. We have to call sin what God calls sin, and that's sin. Call it what it is. The late Dr. Wilbur Chapman used to tell of a Methodist preacher who often spoke on the subject of sin, it being one of his favorite topics and one that was so needed. And he minced no words when it came to describing it, he said, it's the abominable thing that God hates. A leader in his congregation came to him on one occasion and urged him to stop using that ugly word. And to that, he said, Dr. Blank, we wish you would not speak so plainly about sin. He said, our young people hearing you will be much more likely to indulge 
in sin when they hear about it all the time. Call it something else. Call it inhibition. Call it an error. Call it a mistake. Or even a twist in our nature. But don't call it sin. Dr. Chapman's related the story. He says, the preacher said, I understand what you mean. And going to his desk, he brought out a little bottle that he kept in his desk drawer. He said, this bottle contains strychnine. He says, you will see the red label here on it that reads poison. Would you rather, would you suggest that I change this label to something like wintergreen? You see, the more harmless the name, the more dangerous the dose can be. And so we try to, in a sense, beautify sin to find ways so that it isn't so convicting or hard for one to swallow. Abominable means repugnantly hateful detestable, loathsome. That's what he said sin is in God's sight. And so when a Christian loses, if you will, his or her faith, it's a difficult thing for us to watch. We all know brothers and sisters that we've had in our lives at one point or another who have walked with Christ and then turned away and gone back to the world. And sometimes we even question whether the person was really saved, and yet we do not know the heart of man, do we? One could come to church and come to church for months on end or maybe years and go through all the motions to look like they're a Christian and they've never truly come to know Christ. And others might know Christ and they haven't been where maybe they should. They uh, think they don't need the church. And they can worship God at home all by their little lonesome. And so we might look at them and say, well, they're not saved. And yet we do not know the heart of man. So the intent here this morning is not for us to sit in judgment, but for us to, first of all, examine our own hearts. Keep our own heart ever before us. And then if we know someone who is erring, walking in sin, they've turned unto their own ways, we can warn them for the benefit of their soul that they're in danger of hardening. And so in one sense a believer can come a believer can become an unbeliever and lose any security that they they have. I've been at the deathbeds of individuals some that had made a profession had walked an aisle or said a prayer or something and they made a profession of knowing Christ and then they, they didn't walk with God for years and on their deathbed they go I don't know if I was ever saved and there is no security and others think well once saved always saved so if I'm saved I can live any way I want to because I'm going to go to heaven and even if I don't get any rewards, going to heaven is better than going to hell. And so they hold on to that. But I need to remind you that the issue is our heart. With attitudes like that, one might really sincerely question their faith. Consider the deceitfulness of sin. If you look in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3 and verses 12 
to 14, the author writes this. He said, Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. The deceitfulness of sin. Some sins are quite obvious. But one does not fall away in one sense from the Lord. They, step by step by step by step, they move away from the Lord. And they do so by making soft, easy choices. Consider something as easy or as simple as our daily quiet time. We get alone with the Lord, we read the Word, and I'm not under the law, so I don't have to read it every day, which is true. Okay, I don't have to read it every day. But we need to consider this. The choice not to read it today is fine, but then maybe it happens again tomorrow and then the next day. And slowly by slowly we read it less, and we notice that our life hasn't gone to the dogs, if you will. So do we really need it? After all, you get what you need in Bible study or at church. And where I'm going with this is that we slowly, we become calloused. And any of you that have ever worked physically and you've gotten a callous on your hands, you know that at first it starts out like a blister. And then, if you pop that blister, it's real sensitive. The slightest touch can sting. But what happens, and that slightest touch is kind of like sin, where our hearts, God has pierced our heart, but the slightest touch of sin stings at first, but we keep on doing what we're doing. And we keep on applying that friction or that sin to our life by doing it day after day after day. And all of a sudden you develop a callus. I have some itty bitty calluses here. I don't work real hard with my hands. At least I try not to. The hardest work I do with my hands is opening books. But, uh, you know, you can take and you can stick a knife or stick a needle or something down into that callus and you don't even feel it. It's become dead. And imagine, apply that to your heart. When you're, when you're a Christian, God wants us to have that sensitive heart that the slightest sin, if you will, that enters in, stings. And we go, this ain't right. I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't go there. Not because I don't have the freedom to but because it's not going to benefit my spiritual walk and can actually hinder it in some great ways. But we keep on, if we keep on, we become desensitized to it. How many of you are over 40? Some of you are lying to me. Get your hands up. You know, for those of you, I'm assuming that I don't know when the break was, but I was just talking with somebody about this before, and you know, when, when I grew up, you had the good guys always wore white hats. I'm speaking of Westerns here. And the bad guys always wore black hats. And the black guys didn't do, or the black hats didn't do anything good, and the white guys didn't do anything bad. You knew they were a crook, you knew they were a thief, you knew he was a law-abiding whatever, and that's the way it was. You could always tell by the color of their hat, by their fruits, you shall know them in a sense. And when they got shot, they'd grab themselves and they'd fall to the ground, but you never saw blood oozing out. 
and you never saw their innards coming out. But over time, we have been conditioned. We have been conditioned like the frog in the kettle. We've been conditioned. We see it all the time. And then it gets to the point where the gorier, the better. We're being desensitized to seeing some of that. We're desensitized to hearing some of the things that we listen to. I spoke with a young person who was listening to uh, one form of something he called music. <clears throat> I disagreed with him, but then that's my personal taste. But the worst part of this form of music, or this type of music, was that about every other word was a filthy word. And I said, how do you think that affects you as a Christian? He goes, oh, I don't listen to the words. I just like the, the beat. So I watch him when he's just listening to the beat. And he's saying all the words so that he don't listen to. I wonder how he learned them. You know, you see, we're, we're conditioned. We're being conditioned in our society today. And if we don't own up to it and call things what they are and put some things away from us, if you will, we will become desensitized. Some years ago, if we had 13 people shot in an airport, the whole, si the whole nation would have probably dropped to their knees and prayed. But today some people go, wow, I wish I was there. I would have done this. I would have done that. And I wonder what it was like. Well, I'll bet you that give you adrenaline rush. And you hear all kinds of things like this. You're going, what is wrong with people today? You know what the answer is? Sin. Plain and simple. And our hearts have become hardened. And so today I speak to warn you for your own spiritual well-being to warn you, to guard over your heart, to garrison, as it says in Proverbs 4, to garrison your heart lest it become hard to the things of God. First, understand something here that sin and trances. When we talk about the, the deceitfulness of sin, sin and trances, what that means, the dictionary says, is that it's to fill with delight or wonder, to enrapture. Another definition was to put into a trance. It's like if you've ever gone to some place like Niagara Falls or one of the national parks, and uh, I've seen pictures of like uh, the one out in Oregon, and I can't even think of which one it is, but Cheryl goes there all the time. And uh, you look at this, and it just sort of enraptures you. It's, it's so awe-striking. And sin does that. Sin does that to us. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25, speaking here of Moses, it says, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Sin is pleasurable. If it wasn't pleasurable, no one would do it. It's just like, have you ever ached? I mean, really had some experiences with pain and somebody goes hey if you take one of these you won't feel no pain and just the the pleasure of thinking about wow I could be without pain for a while if I only take one of those little magic pills he's got But what happens after you take the one and then the second and then the third? Unless they're prescribed under a doctor and you're under observation by a doctor, you can become addicted. And that which was offering you pleasure now becomes something that can destroy your life and destroy your, your relationship with your mate and your children. 
And I've known individuals that made professions of faith. And one that comes to my mind quite often that I still pray for regularly and uh, got involved in meth. Cost him everything. Very successful businessman. Lost it all. Lost his wife, lost his kids, lost his business, lost everything. Why? Because something offered him pleasure. And if, you're thought, if you think like I think, you're going, well, I'd never let it go that far. Well, that's where the deceit comes in. Because it's a slow conditioning. Sin can certainly promise pleasure. But we need to understand, like the text says, that it's a passing pleasure. It's going to pass. It'll only be pleasurable for so long. And you know, and we can apply that whole mentality to so many different areas. Now, I'm going to use one, and I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that this is sin. But I, you know, what I'm say, stating is trying to get us to think how simple things can hold us, or the promise of something can hold us. And, you know, I've only had one somewhat new car in my life. Most of my cars, we've gotten it uh, through somebody that was an, a car seller that had access to a auction place, auction house, and they would go and find some old clunker that we could find for a couple of hundred dollars, and that would, that would do us. But no matter what it was, I remember the ugliest car that anybody ever made was a gremlin. <clears throat> yeah, some of you have seen them. I had one. And the night that I brought it home, my wa wife looked at me and she goes, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> we are going to ride in that? You think I'm going to ride in that? I said, well, <laughs> if you don't, you walk. <laughs> That's our car. And as ugly as that was, you couldn't have anything to eat in it for a while. You couldn't have anything to drink in it for a while. Why? Because I didn't want you to mess up something that had, was holding a special place here. You see, it was my new car, even though it was quite old. And we can do that with so many things. You go out and buy a brand new car, nothing wrong with that. But all of a sudden, that car, if somebody touches it wrong, boy, you are right in their face. And what happens is after six months, yeah, the kid just threw a gallon of ice cream all over the uh, back seat and everything. It ruined the heated seats and all that stuff. But hey, no big deal. It's just a car. Wasn't that way six months earlier. The point is, is that things that promise us pleasure can also control us. But all of that joy that we thought we'd get out of owning it passes. Give it six months. And sin's destructive forces, if you will, they soon follow. Once we start making soft, simple choices, the destructive forces of sin soon follow. There are social forces and mental, physical, spiritual. You see, it doesn't just affect us spiritually, which is the ultimate way that sin affects us, but it also affects us mentally, the way we think and view things. And socially, the way we interact more than once I've heard somebody say well I'm free in Christ I can do whatever I want to do well Christ died to set you free is that true show me your way is that true 
Okay. I agree with you. He died to set you free. But that freedom was not so that you could, were free to do anything you wanted to do. It was to do what you ought to do, which you could not do before you came to Christ. Before you came to Christ, you were a slave to sin. Once you come to Christ, you are free to choose because now you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you and you are free to choose to do what is right or to do what is wrong. And when we choose to do what is wrong and say, well, it's because I'm free in Christ. No, beloved, you are deceived. Your heart is deceived. Consider Proverbs chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. Now, it's speaking here of an adulterous woman, but the idea behind it all applies to what we're talking about this morning. It says, keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. Lest strangers be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien and you groan at your latter end when your flesh and your body are consumed and you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart spurned reproof, and I have not listened to the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to my instructors, I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. And here Solomon, as he gives us instruction, he's talking about how it literally destroys and how it affects the individual. And fortunately, it sounds like the individual finally realized that they were on a path of destruction and says, how I have hated the instruction and my heart has spurned reproof and I have not listened to the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to my instructors. There was one individual some years ago that has since gone home. But that individual used to come and he would ask different individuals in the church that he considered to have some wisdom. And uh, different times he would come to me and say, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And I go, I wouldn't do that at all. I would never do that. Oh, okay. Well, then he'll go over to, to Jim or to Brian. You might go to Jim, and Jim says, no, I'd never do that. And he'd go, oh, okay. Then he'd go to Brian, and Brian said, no, I'd never do that, okay. Well, he'd go through everybody, and then he'd meet somebody that maybe wasn't even a Christian yet that he knew, and he goes, hey, what do you, I was thinking about doing this. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I'd do that. He'd go, okay. And then when he did it, and he found himself in a uh, little bit of trouble, he'd go, why didn't you tell me? He says, I got counsel and was told to go ahead. Well, you know, God has put individuals over you spiritually as well in the, as in the world that he asks us to honor them. It's not that you've got to be the brightest crane in the box, but, when, but God uses authority in our lives. And even if that authority makes the wrong decision, God will use it for good. I oftentimes reflect back on Joseph, how God had made a promise to Joseph, and years and years later, that promise is realized. And when his brothers who had betrayed him and sold him into slavery, they come thinking that they're going to die, that he's going to kill them. And, he, and they said, please, just make us slaves. We'll be your slaves. He said, no. He said, what you did, you meant it for evil. So their motive was wrong. But he says, what you did out of evil motive, God caused to be good. To bring about this result. And it says, and then he comforted them. 
What a testimony of forgiveness and seeing God's hand in it. There's also, not only is there the passing pleasures of sin or pleasures that we get out of sin that sort of entrances us, holds us hypnotically, but there's also the deceitfulness of riches. Matthew 13 and verse 22 states, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The riches of this world can offer much. It can offer a degree of security, it can give us a degree of pleasure. Ones with money can go a lot of places, do a lot of things. They don't have to scrape for maybe years or whatever to be able to do whatever they want to do. It gives them power. And so, ones pursue riches. Now, there's nothing wrong with making money. Don't misunderstand me here. But there is when that, those riches, if you will, become our God. Consider, you know, when there's economic collapse, when our, the stock market crashes or different things. Any of you that uh, watch the stock market, you see that it goes like this and you know, this guy's going to be president and it either goes down or it goes up and uh, this is going to happen here or this company's going to sell and you watch the stock market and it's just... And when it goes like this, you lose money and when it goes like this, you gain money. And hopefully if you have it in there long enough, it's going to be more up than it is down and you're going to have more than you put into it. But it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So you don't put your trust. You don't put your trust in those riches. And another one in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. It says, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. Now, I want you to note because I hear this verse so many times and it's misquoted. They say, well, money's the root of all evil. Have you ever heard that? That's not what the Scriptures teach. The Scriptures say that the love of money is the root of all evil. When you love money, money becomes your God. If you look down through history, you'd find out that uh, many of the great men that have started businesses and stuff in the world. You know, J.C. Penney, which was once, uh, still is to many a degree, but was once such a household name. He was a Christian man and how much he gave to missions and the guy that invented mentholatum deep heating rub and others that started all these different companies. And they were Christian men that gave more money away. I think it was... R.J. Letourneau or R.G. Letourneau or something that started a huge uh, tractor company. And he said, if God can live off 10%, so can I. So from the get-go, he gave 90% of the money that came into his business to missions. And he died a multi-billionaire after giving 90% continuously away. You see, God uses people that have money to help other people and to support some of the works around the world and to meet our own needs and the needs of those within our own congregation. 
there's many ways that God will use it. And it comes down to how we hold it. This way God can take whatever he wants. After all, it's his. Or at least that's what we say. But when we hold it like this, what you got in there is all that you get. Because God can't take anything out and he won't put anything in. You've got a clenched fist. The love of money can lead one away from God toward destruction. So sin entrances. It entrances, but it deceives with its false promises that you'll never fully experience. Oh, just when I was having fun. We're going to have to pick up on this next week. But you know, seriously, beloved, what I'm sharing with you, I'm not, I'm not trying to play Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to convict you. But I am trying to warn you that we have to watch over our heart with all diligence. For from it flows the springs of life. And the soft choices you make today may well prove to be the hard things that we reap tomorrow. So as we look at this today, and, or as we have looked at it today, and we'll uh, good Lord will and finish up next week. I ask you to weigh it out consider carefully. Cons give it consideration. Because none of us like to be deceived. But I know there have been times in my life when I've been quite deceived because I made soft, easy choices. And anything, any time that I find that there's things I don't want to do, I ask, do I, do, do I don't want to do them because God wants me to and I don't like the pain of making the change? Is it that there's something in my life? You know, I think I may have mentioned this last week, but... I frequently ask myself the question when I see somebody else sin. I ask myself the question, Lord, am I upset because what they're doing is sin? Or am I upset because what they're doing is sin, but they're mirroring me? And you want to fix me. And you know, a good percentage of the time, God is showing me what he wants to change in me. And he's using someone else as that vessel to do it. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for our time. We commit, Lord, this service to you. We pray for Harold, who's coming up to share with us in closing. And Father, we ask your blessing upon each and every one here, Lord. Convict where conviction is need. Speak where you need to speak and give us ears to hear and a heart that will respond. In Jesus' name, amen. For unto you is born this day the city of David the Savior, which is Christ the Lord, Luke 2.11.